And uh, for the next equation, it's not nearly as easy as the first one. Generally, the way we solve that is to simplify the equation a little bit by introducing a new variable u. It is defined as cosine theta. And nu equals m squared, so I have, I have this, you know, I replace nu with uh, m squared, so I have it here. Lambda, I still don't know what it is. The argument u, which is the cosine theta, can range between negative 1 to positive 1. You know, as theta goes from 0 to pi, the, um, this is the, 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 the range of u, which is cosine theta, between negative and positive 1, right? So now this equation, it, it doesn't look anything obvious as far as the solution. So when you do not know how to solve a differential equation, there's no easy way, what do you do? Well, as we did before, we introduce what? An infinite series. Okay, it's tedious, but you can always do it this way. You can always solve it this way. So let's do that. If we, in fact, we just pretend that we did that because the solution is quite tedious. I don't want to bore you too much with the solution. It's not the important part of this uh, lecture. The important part is the physics. How do we obtain the quantization condition? If we did all this calculation, we, we, we just express theta, this function, in terms of an infinite series of u, it turns out the solution is called an associated Legendre polynomial. It's a, fu it's, it's a fancy name. Usually, these equations that are very useful in mathematical physics, they're typically they don't have solutions that can be expressed in elementary functions such as sine, cosine, tangent, exponential. We're usually not that lucky. So the solutions will be expressed in terms of an infinite series or an integral or whatever. And each of them is what's called a special function because they're non-elementary functions. And they're often associated with the name of a mathematician or physicist who, who studied it first. And this particular one was named after Legendre, a French mathematician. So it's called associated Legendre polynomial. And it's got two indices, m and l. m is right here. l turns out to be something that has to do with lambda. Now, the Legendre polynomial, it turns out, which is the solution to this, behaves all right. It doesn't have any strange behavior. But it turns out that if you did this calculation by solving all the coefficients in every term, the Legendre infinite, uh, the polynomial, you'll find that this thing does not behave well when u equals positive or negative 1. Okay? When u equals positive 1, then theta equals 0 degrees. When u equals negative 1, theta equals pi. Clearly, theta equals 0 and pi are physically valid locations, right? And yet, when you plug in u equal to positive or negative 1, you find this thing goes to infinity. Therefore, the wave function, the, the theta part of the wave function, does not behave well. It goes to infinity at these two special angles, theta equal to 0 and theta equal to pi. That, of course, is not allowed. You cannot let that happen. So to satisfy the boundary condition at u equal to positive negative 1, in other words, theta equal to 0 and pi, we must do something. And it turns out this can be done. If you want, if you do not want the angle, the angular part of the wave function theta to go to infinity at these two special angles, it turns out that you must let lambda be to be equal to the product of two successive integers. In other words, L times L plus 1, L being an integer. You cannot just take an arbitrary lambda. If you take anything else than that, you are going to get an infinite solution at theta equal to 0 or theta equal to pi. OK, I did not do the math with you, but the idea is more important than the math here. You're going to do the math when you go to a more advanced quantum mechanics course. Very tedious. But you can you, you can you can get it done. The idea is very important, and that is once again we introduce another quantization condition. This this one for lambda, based on the same idea, which is we must satisfy the boundary conditions for the wave function. In this case, it is the two special angles theta equal to zero and theta equal to pi. You don't want the the solution to go to infinity, and you are forced to choose lambda equal to l times l plus one. Otherwise. The solution will go to infinity at these two angles, which is physically not allowed. So here, L turns out it has to be an integer, and lambda must be the product of L times the L plus 1. And L is related to M as well. Okay, L must be greater or equal to M. In other words, for every L, 
you can find several values of m, but this m cannot have an absolute value which exceeds l, otherwise something will go wrong again. And uh, therefore, for a given l, m can have these values, negative l, negative l plus 1, plus, 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 all the way to positive l. So in general, how many different m values would correspond to a given l? That will be 2l plus 1. Okay, 2l plus 1. And we'll see that again later. So here is our second quantum number. And you combine the solution to the theta part of the wave function and the already given solution to the phi part of the wave function, you now have a complete wave function describing the angular dependency of the wave in any essentially symmetrical potential. So let's look at the angular part of the wave function. It is the product of the, of the uh, phi dependent part and the theta dependent part, right? This is the phi dependent part, e, e to the negative, uh, positive negative i m phi, and here is the uh, theta dependent part, which turns out to be the Legendre polynomial, associated Legendre polynomial. And there are two indices, or two quantum numbers associated with that. One is m, the other is l. m has to be integer, so that this function remains periodic with, with a period of 2 pi, and l has to be al also another integer, which guarantees the uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, when theta equals 0 or pi, the uh, wave function doesn't go to infinity. So, therefore, the uh, angular part of the wave function depends on two quantum numbers, L and M, L and M. So, therefore, we, we add these two quantum numbers as, as uh, subscripts Y of L, M. This function, the product of these two, is very useful in physics, extremely important in physics. We call it spherical harmonics. Is other one of the spherical harmonic functions. Again, this is the angular part of the wave function. It has to be normalized. Here is the normalization condition. Y theta phi, absolute value squared, modulus squared, that is the amplitude of finding this particle to exist within a, so a certain solid angle because it's the angular part, right? It's just orientation. Okay. Uh, angular, it's solid angle d omega. Do you recall the definition of d omega, the solid angle? Well, this dA is an, a small area on, a, on the surface of a sphere of radius r. The solid angle is defined as the, as the area dA divided by r squared. That's how we define it. Okay? And therefore, if you integrate over the entire sphere, you get d omega, integral over d omega. What do you get? Well, r squared is a constant which I take out. And then integrate over dA, you just get 4 pi r squared. So the entire solid angle over the entire three-dimensional space is 4 pi. This, this is the integral. And uh, d omega itself is dA over r squared. If you write down dA in uh, spherical coordinate divided by r squared, you're going to get sine theta d theta d phi. That's, uh, that should be familiar for, to you in spherical coordinate. And uh, we demand that the, the uh, integration of this modulus squared over the entire three-dimensional uh, space in, in all directions, okay, over the entire solid angle, equals one. That tells me what? It tells me that this particle must be found in some, at some directions in space. If you count all the possible directions, the chance of finding this particle is equal to one, of course. Okay, so here I did another calculation of d omega based, not based on this, but based on that. I plug that into here. I integrate it over theta and phi, of course, I get 4 pi, as expected. Again, the angular part of the wave function, which is the spherical harmonics, for any centrally symmetrical potential is the same. Centrally symmetrical means u does not depend on the angle theta and phi. It's isotropic. It depends only on the distance r. And uh, we have not discussed yet what are the physical meanings of these two quantum numbers L and M. We just say do you, do you, ha you have to have two quantum numbers in order to satisfy the boundary conditions, period, be, it, be it periodic or be it special angles. We have not discussed the physical meaning of L and M, but we will do that later. And it turns out you will see this, both of these quantum numbers will have to do with angular momentum. And you know, even in classical physics, we know something about essentially symmetrical potential. Okay, such as the Coulomb potential, such as the gravitational potential. They're all essentially symmetrical potential with no angular dependency. With no angular dependency, the force, say from the Earth, uh, from the Sun to the Earth, or from the proton to the electron, the, the force points along the line 
connecting the the, the two to two objects, right? It it was it points along the radius r, and therefore this force does not exert any torque on the uh, particle being attracted, right? So the, the Earth does not get any torque from the sun, nor does the uh, the uh, electron receive any torque from the proton, and no torque means something is conserved. What is it? Angular momentum, right? So there is conservation of angular momentum for the Earth moving around the sun or for the electron moving around the proton. This is valid even in classical physics. And in fact, for any centrally symmetrical potential, you have the same idea, and that is the force points along the line connecting the two particles, and therefore this force provides no torque, so the angular momentum of the particle in motion inside this centrally symmetrical potential is fixed. And so you look at the angular part of the wave function, you have a constant quantity, conserved quantity, which is angular momentum. So it makes total sense to, to if we discover that these two constants, these two quantum numbers L and M, have to do with the angular momentum of the system because it is indeed conserved. The general expression for the uh, uh, spherical harmonic functions can be pretty complicated, even though the phi part is quite simple, e to the positive negative i m phi. The, uh, the uh, uh, theta part is, again, the associate legenda polynomial, which we usually express in terms of uh, uh, you know, a, a sum of, uh, of series. That's not very easy to do. But at least we can look at what happens when, you, when L and M are not very large. And these are the, usually the ones that are most interesting to us. They are of the most important practical applications. So let's take a look at some of the lower ordered spherical harmonics. I'm not asking you to derive those, okay? But I just want to show you what they, what they look like. The lowest order one is when L equal to zero and M equal to zero. Now remember, M cannot exceed absolute value of L. And this L equals zero, and therefore M has no choice but to remain zero. So you have the lowest order one, Y zero, zero. And it turns out that is a constant. That is a constant. This is the only spherical harmonics that is a constant, which means there is no angular dependency of the wave function. And uh, that means the uh, wave function has no preferable direction in space. It's totally isotropic. So the electron cloud, which we'll discuss later, will look like a, some sort of a, like a ball, like some sort of sphere with no angular preference. This is a unique feature of the lowest level of the lowest ordered spherical harmonics. Okay, it is only true for zero, zero, not for nothing else. The next one is L equal to one. When L equal to one, M can have three possible values, negative one, zero, and positive one, right? And here is what happens when M equal to zero. For all M equal to zeros, the phi part of the wave function is E plus or minus I M phi when M equal to zero, and that equals one. It's a constant. So for all m equal to zeros, there is no phi dependency, as you can see here. There is no phi dependency. There's two. There's one zero, even two zero n equal to two. See, there is no phi dependency. Depends only on the angle theta. That makes sense. Okay. But when m equals plus or minus one, then the phi dependency appears because the phi dependency is e to the i m phi. So e to the i m uh, m equals one or negative one. So you have e to the plus or minus i phi. Here you have e to the plus or minus i two phi because m equals two, right? So the phi part is very simple. The theta part, that depends on what L is equal to. So here are some of the lower order ones. We may use some of these expressions later when we deal with the wave functions of the hydrogen atom for certain low energy states. So we're done with the angular part of the wave function. We have one task left, and that is we need to solve what? The remaining equation, which is the radial part of the Schrodinger's equation. The radial part of the Schrodinger's equation depends on u. So we have to plug in the expression for u in our case. It's negative ke squared over r. That is the coulomb potential between the pro proton and electron. And then here is the radial wave equation. I already plug in the value for lambda. Remember in the uh, when we separated just when we separated r from theta and phi, there was a lambda, right? But lambda is equal to l times l plus one, which you already know. You plug that in. This is the uh, uh, the potential part, it depends on the potential itself, so we're only doing it for the coulomb potential. Our job is to try to find the energy. Now we know from even from the Bohr model, the energy of the hydrogen atom, the inside hydrogen atom for the electron is quantized. Q 
can we solve this equation and find the energy to be quantized? We didn't get it from theta and phi. There was no energy expression in that. There was only L and M, which has to do with angular momentum, but no E. Is there a way for us to find the energy and show that it is quantized? Well, before we tackle that, you recall that from physics, uh, from the previous chapter, uh, when we discussed the uh, solution in one dimension of Schrodinger's equation, we were able to obtain quantization of energy from what? From solving the Schrodinger's equation and demanding it to satisfy boundary conditions, right? And can we perform the same magic here to find E allowed values and show it that it's quantized? It turns out, yes, we can do that again. The quantization of energy is always a natural result of solving the Schrodinger's equation and satisfying its boundary conditions. The solution to this equation is not very easy. In fact, it is, again, another special function. And we call it the Laguerre polynomials. Laguerre polynomial. And this Laguerre polynomial, if you work it out, you find that, unfortunately, the Laguerre polynomial goes to infinity at r equal to infinity at infinite distance, which is totally wrong because, you know, when r equals infinity, the electron, how, what's the chance of the electron being found over there? Zero, right? Because the hydrogen atom is finite sized. So we don't want to accept that boundary condition, okay? And to make sure that psi does not go to infinity, but should go to zero, it turns out if you want make, to make that happen, you cannot choose, choose any E anymore. E must satisfy the following condition. E must equal to this, uh, some sort of constant divided by n squared. And this n must be an integer. And this looks familiar, folks. What is this? This is the expression for the energy eigenvalues in the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom. So you know we have indeed rediscovered the quantization of energy with the exact same expression. So the quantum mechanics gave us the same solution as the energy eigenvalue of the successful Bohr model. And this n is our last quantum number. We have three quantum numbers in three-dimensional space. Right? We already know m and l. Here's the third and last quantum number, n. n is called the principal quantum number. Okay. Principal. It's the most important one. Why is that? Because it has to do with energy. This, this is the one that controls the energy. If you do not equate E with this, then again, what's the problem? The solution of the radio wave function will go to infinity at r equal to infinity, and we don't like that. So we are forced to accept the uh, uh, quantization of energy. It's nothing that is forced upon us out of nowhere. Rather, it is forced upon us by something we we agree, which is a con which is condition of that we must satisfy at r equal to infinity. So this is natural, okay. Even though the work is tedious, the result is natural. We can accept it without any doubt. And therefore, the radial part of the wave function has two quantum numbers associated with it. One is l, l is already here, another is n. So therefore, r is now uh, a, a function with two uh, quantum numbers, n and l. And uh, what is the expression for R and L? That depends on what N is, what R is, right? Well, it turns out that uh, this N cannot be too small. It cannot be smaller than L, okay? In fact, L st starts from zero, right? It can go as much as only N minus one. So for example, for N equal to one, which is the lowest energy state, the ground state, L can only have one value, which is zero, because one minus one is zero. For N equal to two, L can have only two values, 0 and 1, and so on. And uh, the most, again, the most important values, uh, expressions for R, this function, are the ones with small n and small l, because the hydrogen atom usually is found in the ground state or near the ground state. So let's look at some of the uh, uh, lower, lower index values. Again, don't worry about how to we solve it, but I'm just showing you, this, uh, you know, some of the most common solutions you can if you want, plug any of these in to here to, to show that these two sides indeed are equal to each other. Okay? These solutions, any of these solutions will, will satisfy this with the right value of n being equal to 
one here and b equal to two here. This is the first excited state, n equal to uh, n equal to two. In the case here, this is n equal to two. Here, l equal to zero, l equal to one, and so on. We are going to take a closer look at the ground state, and also we're going to take a a good look at n, uh, n equal to two. So the ground state wave function is rather simple, e to the negative r over a, so some sort of exponential decay as we go out. And uh, what kind of picture are we looking at? Let's see. 